Hi, my name is Dr. Amit Mishri. I'm a sports psychiatrist and chair of the Royal College of Psychiatrists Sports and Exercise Psychiatry Group. I'm going to be talking about mental health in elite sport and also the benefits of exercise for the general population on the physical performance show. That's the voice of this week's featured guest on this expert edition of the physical performance show, Dr. Amit mystery sports and exercise psychiatrist as we tackle the all-important topic of athletes mental health and the is failure is not an option i've had my ups and my downs i think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, brought to you by the upcoming Masters Athlete World First Online Symposium, brought to you by the Physical Performance Show and Function to Fitness. I'm Brad Beer, sports physiotherapist and exercise scientist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. Each week, we'll bring you the latest and greatest information and inspiration designed to help you perform at your physical best. We do this across a range of different episodes, interest editions, featured performers, coaches corners, and expert editions. And just several days shy of what will be the online Masters Athlete Symposium event, we wanted to feature Dr. Emmett Mystery, one of the 16 experts presenting at the Masters Athlete Online Symposium, in full around his body of work and his contribution to the world of health and performance with this conversation around Athletes' Mental Health. By way of bio, Dr. Emmett Mystery is a clinical lecturer in sport and exercise medicine. He is the chair of the Royal College of Psychiatrists Sport and Exercise Special Interest Group. And of course, he is a clinical sports and exercise psychiatrist hailing from the UK. Dr. Mystery is the co-author of a recently released book, Case Studies in Sports Psychiatry, which is a must for anyone working in the field of sports and exercise. And through today's conversation, Dr. Mystery shares many learnings pertinent to every athlete, every coach, every health and sports practitioner. Topics explored include exercise addiction. What is it and how is it differentiated from a healthy undertaking of sporting activity? When Dr. Mystery shared the characteristics of exercise addiction, I'll put my hand up and say I ticked most of the boxes. What is the role of perfectionism in sport? When is it helpful and when does it become problematic or potentially maladaptive? Dr. Mystery shares around depression and anxiety in athletes. What are the warning signs and what are the ways these conditions can be best treated and stewarded? And other learnings include the topics of eating disorders and disordered eating, event anxiety and ADHD and its role in sporting performance. Get ready with a pen and paper. The learnings are many. This is a very important conversation. And in the landscape that we find ourselves in through the pandemic, it's arguably never been a more important time than to consider our mental health as athletes and those of the athletes we work with. Here is my conversation with Dr. Emmett Mystery, sports and exercise psychiatrist. Dr. Emmett Mystery, this for me as the host of the show is very exciting. Uh, Someone with your expertise uh, I think has been missing from the show for some time. So welcome to the Physical Performance Show. Thank you. Dr. Emmett Mystery, UK based, recently co-authored a a clinical case studies book uh, on uh, on sports psychiatry, case studies in sports psychiatry with a few of your your colleagues. But can you bring listeners uh, into the into the fold of your world clinically and 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 how did you end up in this fairly unique field of sports psychiatry so uh, thank you for inviting me um so sports psychiatry is a relatively novel uh, specialty so it's still within its infancy so um in the last five years i'd say there's been much more awareness of the 
um, elite athletes' mental health needs, which um, you could say are typical to the general population in terms of the typical stresses that we have. Um, but athletes also have some unique sport-specific stresses, which um, we've got better at recognising, and we're starting to understand that a little bit better. So sports psychiatry is, if we were to put it in a nutshell in terms of what we do in the UK as a group, we have a, a two, I'd say, two principal aims. Uh, one of them is advocating for moderate levels of safe exercise for severe mental illness. But on the flip side, the other aspect is optimising mental health for elite athletes. So there is an overlap in those interests and they're kind of opposite sides of the spectrum in terms of one is I'm talking about underactivity and in athletes talking about overactivity. So it's been able to recognise the differences and how we recognise and treat that better. So two sides of the, the coin, if you like, the underactivity for people that would ideally or would benefit from more exercise and then also helping typically the I mean, it's uh, in brackets, the over-exercise of the elite athlete that's at the very pointy end of performance with the, as you say, unique uh, sport-specific stressors that they deal with. Exactly. And Emmett, your background yourself, you grew up swimming and, in fact, you shared just prior to recording that uh, you used to swim uh, with one of the uh, the Brownlee brothers, uh, Alistair. So you grew up, obviously, uh, with a keen interest in, in sports yourself. Yeah, I'd, I'd say, I mean, I was from a kind of atypical... British Indian background. So I was probably the only Indian guy who wasn't really interested in cricket and I wasn't very good at cricket. <laughs> but when it came to contact sport, uh, I really kind of enjoyed it. And over time, I got a bit better. So, um, you know, playing rugby, you know, up, up to kind of county, national level uh, contact sport. So from an early age, I was always encouraged to participate in sport. And um, you know, we know the benefits of that, whether we're talking about our own mental health, being in that social environment is, is so positive. Um, so, you know, from the grassroots level, you know, sport is, you know, overwhelmingly has those positive benefits. When we focus on elite sport mental health, it's just different pressures, which we kind of um, try and support athletes with. But from a young age, I've always been around that. So I've always been a big advocate of that. And um, that's kind of one of my interests in general psychiatry as well. So a few years ago, I felt we had to do more as psychiatrists to be advocating lifestyle interventions for our patients and I've been quite encouraged that over the last few years um, there's been much more um, discussions about this in terms of how do we advocate better diet, how do we advocate for you know better levels of exercise and it was actually two physiotherapists who, who inspired me. Uh, one of them is an Aussie as well, uh, you may know Simon Rosenbaum and there's also Brendan Stubbs who's in the UK and they're kind of academic researchers and in the last five years they've just really nailed the evidence base for using exercise for mental health. So that's how I got inspired. And then over time, um, I then started to focus a bit more on, on the sports angle as well. Yeah, right. So that's your career in uh, in uh, in two minutes, which uh, <laughs> has probably been the better part of 20, two to three decades to, uh, to, to arrive where you are. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Mystery, the... The differentiator, but what's the difference between most people would recognise a sports psychologist? Mm -hmm. What's the difference between a sports psychologist role and a sports psychiatrist's role? I think that's the. It, I mean, that's a great question, and sometimes it can be difficult to define it because there's always going to be an overlap. If you work in mental health, um, we talk a lot about the different P's in sport at the moment. So, sports psychologist, sports, sports psychotherapist, sports psychiatrist, and there'll always be uh, an overlap. I think. The, the way I distinguish it in my head is psychiatrists, we are medically trained. So we go through, you know, that medical model and we focus more on risk assessment. And also if it becomes um, such a level of distress for a patient, we may have to consider medication. But if you're going to prescribe medication, you need a clinician who's trained in that area and knows how to prescribe medications whilst not hindering performance. So that's the best way I look at it. If we look a little bit deeper, we can think about in terms of um, what are we um, trying to offer in terms of are we trying to optimise performance or are we there for health? Now, as a clinician and as a doctor, my primary role will always be trying to optimise health and looking after health. That's the number one principle. But we can still work along the performance models and the performance pathways. And there will be different clinicians, you know, the different P's that I mentioned, to work along different parts of that. So they may focus more on performance or may, you know, ultimately just be about health. So it's a tricky question to answer, but I think from my point of view, health would always come first. 
And I think we do have overlapping skills that a psychologist can offer as well. Um, and there's also very specialised psychologists who are really good at the performance side. And I could never uh, pretend that I'd have expertise in that. So I think there's probably complementary roles along that pathway. To me, that intuitively makes sense. Uh, and I think that would very much speak to any questions people have as well. And you mentioned risk assessment. It might be worth going into some of the pathologies you do see and if you find it easy to delineate between the recreational athlete and the elite athlete by all means uh please do so Emmett but what pathologies might you be encountering I think the the tricky thing is athletes by occupation are high level exercisers that's that's their function and their relationship with exercise and nutrition by definition, if we were to look at it on paper, we would say, well, that's that's abnormal compared to the general population. So often when we're seeing, in inverted commas, severe mental illness or mental distress in athletes, um, we've always got to remember that that's going to be atypical to what we see in the general population. So some examples, I mean, the two best examples of that are exercise and nutrition. So if we take exercise, for example, um, I talk a lot about the exercise spectrum. And a good, a good example of that would be if we talk about the general population, when I work in an eating disorders clinic, the common presentation for somebody who may have problems with their um, body image and their eating habits and their exercise levels is when I was younger, I was bullied, um, I had poor self-esteem, I was overweight, and I needed to get healthy. So I then start exercising as a healthy motivator. I start enjoying it. I get that endorphin rush. I get positive uh, feedback. So I, it's, it's a positive loop. I keep doing it. Now, when that gets problematic is when we then start using that to challenge and deal with emotional trauma. And it becomes more than just a healthy hobby. It starts becoming very regimented, uh, very rigid regimes. There's less flexibility. We're no longer attending social events because we're so concerned about how this is going to impact our exercise regime. And then we start picking up the injuries. So it's no longer just having fun. So if you're a runner, you know, we talk about plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, all these injuries, they go from localized to systemic. So we're now talking about a bigger problem, which is very regimented. We're training when we shouldn't be. So we're injured. We're feeling guilty. And um, if we're not training, there's huge disruptions to our kind of daily function. And we're picking up these systemic injuries. So often in sport, we talk about REDS. So that's relative energy deficiency in sport. And we're talking about osteopenia, so thinning of the bones, all the way to a full-blown osteoporosis. In females, we're talking about amenorrhea, so loss of the periods. In men, loss of libido. And so it's a real kind of spectrum, and it can be quite insidious. And anybody who works in sport can probably relate to that. And if we compete in sport ourselves, a lot of us can say, well, actually, I can see how that happens. And when we talk about exercise addiction, it is akin to a, a drug addiction. We're talking about you know, that salience, tolerance. We're no longer exercising for the rush. We're exercising because we're fearful of the withdrawal symptoms. If I don't exercise, I'm going to get, you know, fidgety. I'm going to get depressed. I'm going to get anxious. And, and that's what we tend to see. So that's the kind of spectrum that I tend to discuss with people. And um, elite athletes will, by function of being high-level exercisers, will have an odd relationship with exercise. So if they go through a trauma, if they get deselected, if they get injured, they can use exercise as a, a maladaptive coping mechanism. And that's sometimes the problems that we see with kind of eating disorders and also exercise addiction. I was just taking notes there. And um, I guess a question that pops out is the characteristics you described there, Emmett, uh, regimented, rigid, uh, training when shouldn't, feeling guilty, social network sometimes, uh, you know, suffering, uh, <laughs> it, 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 with a tongue in cheek, but it, it felt like a uh, characteristic list of many, if not most, endurance athletes that I can think of. I've often thought, even with my own journey over the years, with my own recreational sporting pursuits, what's the difference between being committed and dedicated and disciplined to being, you know, as you say, contributing to potential pathology? And you said, if I'm, if I'm, uh, if I got it right, that the difference is one: you're you're not no longer exercising for the for the rush, but you're fearful of the effects of withdrawal. Yeah, yeah. Gosh, that's challenging. I think it's it's a great, you know, I think you've hit the nail on the head in terms of what's you know what do we define as normal and what's what's abnormal. And 
I think the nature of endurance sport is it is an extreme, and I think we've redefined what excellence is and what the pursuit of excellence is in endurance sport. I think you know, 20 years ago, if you complete a marathon, that would be you know a level of success, like you know that's. But that's no longer the baseline. I think now it's about you know ultra marathons, 24-hour endurance. We are kind of pushing you know what we define as success in endurance. And I think there is a certain characteristics about endurance sport, and I think you questioned it really well about well is that personality trait or not and i think we talk about perfectionism in in elite sport and it is a double-edged sword because having those traits so being obsessive very disciplined conscientious if you apply those traits to certain aspects of life so for example career we can you know we can really excel the difficulty happens is when we get very objective and very prescriptive and quantify you know when it comes to exercise and nutrition that's when the problems tend to occur. And that's what we often see in eating disorders in, in sport. Because on the one hand, those certain traits can really make you excel as an athlete. If you apply those traits to the wrong aspects, that's when you tend to get into trouble. So they can be, so it's not to poo poo or uh, dismiss sometimes these natural personality traits that can allow you to excel in career or sports or any facet of life. But it's just, I guess, recognize that. Uh, they can sway the other way where they do start to uh, be problematic rather than serve you positively. That's right. Okay, that's that's fantastic. Uh, I spoke just today, uh, Emma, to an athlete who otherwise would have been representing uh, the nation, Australia, at the Tokyo Olympic Games, right about now, and she has in the past had her own psychological battles, and her comment was that this current status we're in as we record we're recording through this covid pandemic that it had allowed her to just stop trying to control things and just to basically let go and have fun and be a human they were her words are you finding that that's one of the byproducts of the world's current state with your work yeah i think um i think anecdotally talking to different clinicians and and athletes i think when we talk about resilience, we talk about, you know, adversity and, um, you know, how we cope with that and how we manage that. And I think if we have a positive mindset, we can view it as opportunities and opportunities to, opportunities to learn. And I think that being able to control the controllable and being able to say, well, actually, what can I control and what can't I control? And being able to live with that, I think, is really powerful. And that example you've given we have seen that. They have people who've said, well, actually, I can't control this. What can I do in this situation to, you know, what can I do to make the best of this situation? So I think that's a nice example of that. But there are people who've struggled as well. And what we've commonly seen is this relationship with exercise. So I can't control the circumstance at the moment. But I'll tell you what, I can control my exercise levels. I can really control what I'm eating. And that can get very obsessive as well. Um, so there has been positives. Um, but I think there have been some people who struggled as well. The, the benefits of sport is that because of the nature of sport, traveling, touring, and um, busy um, like schedules, they're already used to like, remote consultants. So actually um, having the team support, being able to speak to clinicians um, you know, remotely has been quite helpful for them. Yeah, so interesting. And then you must see the other end of the spectrum where not being able to control this situation has possibly thrown people further off center and perhaps exacerbated mental illness maybe it's brought it to the fore or it's actually if you like flared someone up maybe not the right terms yeah i think i think that's i mean it's, i mean we, we all cope in in our own ways and i think um you know that that can happen as well and you use the the the, the, the r word the resilience term would you say that's something that can be it's a difficult question, but the percentage of that being a natural attribute or personality trait versus trainable. What's as a sports psychiatrist, as a trained medical psychiatrist, what's your view on this resilience? It's it's obviously a buzzword, but on this trait, resilience, trainable or not? Yeah, I think it's quite um, it is quite a contentious issue because you know you could argue some people are just born with it. My personal view is that we can all develop, we can all pick up skills and we talk a lot about the athlete mindset. My personal view is I don't think we can use resilience as a blanket tool. I don't think it's beneficial just going somewhere and saying, look, I'm going to do a workshop about resilience and, and that's that. I think we have to personalise it to people's situations. I think 
particularly around their kind of social environment and being able to pick out what's worked for them before. What have you got in your own kind of, you know, who are your personal contacts? Um, who do you go to for support? Um, I think that can be really helpful. I think there is a certain buy-in. I think if you have somebody in front of you who is high functioning and you can work on, you know, their focus, their self-confidence, what their social support is, controlling the controls, that is part of that resilience toolkit. And if that works, that's great. But sometimes you may come across somebody who is just not amenable to that at that point in time. So they might be struggling. And I think that's where, if you've got expertise as a sports psychiatrist, you can be flexible along that spectrum. And you can say, look, resilience would be great to develop in you. But right now, you're struggling with, say, depression or anxiety. We need to manage that first, and then we can come back to that. Yeah, that makes sense. Emmett, you just use those two terms that everyone will be familiar with, depression and anxiety. As a sports physiotherapist, I'm not trained on this side of things, but as an observation, and, and by no means am I adept at you know, classifying these things, but just as an observation, I, I often feel that most athletes that walk into a consulting room, whether they're recreational or elite or any level, there might be an element of both, if not one of those, for almost every injury. So what indicators uh, might you share with the listener of the show around how to detect when things might be leaning towards more of a state of anxiety or depression? What, what might you suggest we keep an eye out for? Just before I come on to that, one thing to mention is that later on this year, the International Olympic Commission um, are going to be releasing some screening tools about how we assess depression, anxiety, eating disorders, the common types of pathology we see in athletes, that is going to come out. So for practicing clinicians like yourself on, on the front line, we're going to have better tools to, to, to recognize this because the limitation we've got is that a lot of the previous tools we use, they're not validated in athletes. They've been used in the general population. So we can't really pinpoint exactly the, the symptoms. But I think this has been something that's been recognized. And in a few months' time, we will have better ways of doing that. So it will, it will be validated tools. If we're thinking about the recreational athletes, so somebody who's just coming in in clinic who's a high-level exerciser, we can use the similar types of symptoms that we'd see in, in the general population. So, you know, depression in terms of over two weeks of low mood. We talk about anhedonia. So, you know, no longer enjoyment in hobbies, activities, no pleasure, uh, loss of energy. Then we have lots of other symptoms as well. And we kind of classify them as biological. So it might be, you know, poor sleep, loss of libido, uh, loss of appetite. We also have somatic, so physical symptoms as well. And these can feel like a checklist sometimes. We're ticking boxes. But ultimately, I think it all depends on how that's affecting the patient in terms of their daily function. And obviously, again, in psychiatry, we always go to the extreme end of risk as well in terms of, you know, are they suicidal? Are they putting themselves at risk or others at risk? And I think if we're going to do a comprehensive job in sport, we have to cover these spectrums as well. Um, but ultimately, if there is anybody in distress um, and they're struggling, we always try and do the least restrictive thing. And we talk about biopsychosocial. So anybody who works in mental health, has to follow these principles. So the least restrictive thing to do is thinking about social contacts, who's in their group, um, who can they access for support. We mentioned about the distinction between psychology and psychiatry. So psychologists are experts at CBT, so cognitive behaviour therapy, using talking therapies to help people in distress. And if we need to, we can do medication as well which does have a good evidence base if somebody is acutely depressed or is anxious. Yeah, wow. Um, so you listed some characteristics of, uh, of the depression state there, and you also mentioned that there's a spectrum, a continuum, uh, where on one end there's someone that you know is considering has su have, having suicidal uh, thoughts, I guess. What about anxiety, Emmett? There's, there's a really good diagram that I learned in medical school. So it's the um, Yerkes-Dodson so Yerkes performance curve. And I don't know whether you've come across it, but basically the, the principle is that we all need a bit of stress. We all need a bit of cortisol to get that optimum performance. And anxiety in sport can be functional. So before you're about to race, before you're about to do that big competition, it's perfectly normal to get anxiety. And, and it's not for us to make that a medical issue. And often people will have that anxiety, they'll finish the race and everything's fine. And I think that's when we just say, look, we can monitor it, but we don't have to step in. Anxiety, when it starts to have an impact on daily function, 
and it's affecting different aspects of our lives. It's stopping us from functioning and, you know, the commitments that, that we have. That's when we, t- we see it as more of a problem. And sometimes that can stem into generalised anxiety disorder. And again, having somebody who's trained in sport and psychiatry helps you to distinguish, well, what's considered normal reaction and what's abnormal. What's abnormal and what's normal. Uh, and you said that generalised anxiety disorder... Uh, use that that label, I guess. Uh, what might be the characteristics of generalised anxiety disorder? So it's it's a combination of you know the psychological and again talking about the the, the uh, physical. So having that distress, feeling anxious, it can be trivial events or it might be set phobias, might be certain situations that make people feel anxious. But with that, we're talking about the very physical symptoms. So the palpitations, the sweating. The uh, tummy upsets, it's, it's a combination of, you know, the psychological and the physical. And most importantly, it's, it's a disruption on function. Sometimes people can have these symptoms and, and they're functional and not putting themselves at risk, not putting others at risk. And some people, and, you know, they, they, can, they can harness it and they can manage it. And again, that's when we say, well, do we need to step in? If it's not distressing somebody, we don't have to. But if it is causing such a level of distress... Mm. We should be stepping in and offering you know, the biopsychosocial options that we have. Which could include medication, yeah. potentially. Yeah. And it sounds like in those instances, if they're self-managing, uh, it might be that exercise is a valid and constructive tool for that individual, even if, would you say, even, Emmett, if they are a, an over-exerciser? Yeah, I think a good, a good example would be if we're thinking about RTP. So somebody's injured, return to play, We spoke about that withdrawal. So if you stop exercising, you will get depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms. We know that can happen. But what we know is that, you know, concussion protocols, eating disorder protocols, depression, anxiety, returning to sport, we know that getting back into that physical activity can be protective and can help with mental health as well. I mean, it is a really grey area sometimes. So the reason why I'm mentioning this, because it is relevant, is depression versus overtraining syndrome. Because... When people are over are, are over exercising and there's this energy mismatch, so energy intake versus energy expenditure, and in sport we call this REDS, so this relative energy deficiency in sport. If we're at a prolonged mismatch for say over eight weeks, there's poor sleep, the stress, we can end up in overtraining syndrome, or in the UK we call that unexplained underperformance syndrome, and a lot of those symptoms that we have are akin to depression. So the low mood, the lack of energy, poor concentration, you know, if we were to mirror the the checklist, they'd be exactly the same. And often the the, the term we we give it it will be dependent on who's doing the diagnosis. So if it was a sports physician, your first diagnosis would be overtraining syndrome. Whereas if you have a wider MDT and you're not sure on the diagnosis and you want to query it, you see a sports psychiatrist and they may say, well, this is depression. So it can be a really gray area, but there is overlap in terms of, you know, these types of presentations that we see in elite sport. And regardless of which uh, label you end up with, it's the same symptom uh, and signs that are being expressed. Yeah, and I think, and I think that's... But the treatment would be very different. Exactly, and I think that's, that's the message that we need to address, and that's, again, the remit of sports psychiatry. So we talk about, is it depression or is it overtraining syndrome? Mm. We see anxiety and depression as normal in concussion, um, so that's neuropsychological symptoms. We expect that. But if it goes on for more than two months, then could it be something else? So having um, our argument is that having a wider MDT, we can pick up things that are being missed and we can manage that you know, sooner. That The best example of that would be eating disorders. So often in sport, and we've seen it in the media, is somebody's um, diagnosed with relative energy deficiency in sport and we haven't really explored the underlying psychopathology why is somebody in reds if it's by accident and it's just we've got a mismatch because the training too much and the the diet plan doesn't manage that that's easy to resolve we just have to amend the diet plan but if there is an element of this is intentional or there's kind of the psychopathology of i'm fearful of gaining weight because i'm fat Um, There's that body dysmorphia. They're misusing substances to lose weight, so laxatives, purging. We've missed that. And we know that, you know, if the longer we leave an eating disorder, the worse the prognosis. We have like a three-year window period where we have to act sooner because we know the outcomes are better. So, again, that's a really good example of when 
if we're unsure about a diagnosis and there should be some, you know, there may be something else going on, we need to explain further detail. Yeah, that's uh, that's, that's fascinating and and, and challenging in the same breath. Uh, And the the, the listener of the Physical Performance Show, Emmett, those terms are unexplained underperformance syndrome uh, versus, you know, overtraining. That concept isn't new and nor is the concept obviously of relative energy deficiency in sport and one of your UK colleagues there Dr Nikki Kay sports endocrinologist she did a great job of differentiating between intentional and unintentional yeah l- low energy availability or red s and it's a quite an easy differentiator in terms of okay if there's patterns of intentional ways of calorie restricting or as you say body dysmorphia issues then then that makes that's easy to pick up in the sense that if it's shared, but there'll be times when that's not shared, correct? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's the responsibility of the MDT, it's the responsibility of the team to think about how we manage that. And the best example I've seen is some of the Scandinavian countries. So from the outset with the athlete, they have a strict contract where they say, if you engage in um, disordered eating or exercise, you know, you're over-exercising, they have ways of amending the, the training. So they'll say, look, you need to take a break now because we signed this contract where you deviate from the policy. And I think that's a proactive way of trying to prevent, you know, the things we've mentioned already in terms of osteopenia, osteoporosis, um, females losing their, their periods, because that in itself is not, that's not physiological, it's not normal. And I think it's been branded as normal, you know, it's been normalised in sport. And, you know, that is, as you know, having experts like Dr. Key, she would have said that we know that that's not that's not right. And I think we have to be proactive from the start and we need to prevent problems rather than it going further down the line. We're now trying to kind of correct things that should have been addressed years ago. And you mentioned that all important point that there's a three year window for uh, these things to intervene. Does that mean that beyond three years it's unsalvageable or just that the outcomes will be different as a result of it not being uh, dealt with inside that window? I mean, we know from the, the general population, so general population eating disorders, um, the models which have early interventions and earlier support, we know that, you know, at six months, 12 months, further down the line, the outcomes are better in terms of uh, weight and also the distress associated with an eating disorder. Why it's very topical in sport is that if you combine disordered eating and exercise addiction together, um, so we call that secondary exercise addiction, and we compare that to primary exercise addiction, which is just being addicted to exercise and not having disordered eating, we know that recovery is much harder. So it's really important that if we suspect any of these problems, that we get in sooner. In answer to your question about you know the, these window periods, what I've seen on inpatient wards, when I worked on an inpatient eating disorder ward, it's very easy to um, get the energy levels up. So we can do something called refeeding protocols. If somebody gets admitted, they're at a low weight. We can address the energy levels in the space of a few weeks. But on a hormonal level, um, when we're talking about you know, bone structure, that can take months and years. And that includes the menstrual period as well. And the real issue is, is that if we get to osteoporosis, which is that kind of irreversible stage of the bones being super thin, high risk of like frailty fractures, we've definitely missed the boat because we can't reverse that. So energy levels we can sort out in the space, you know, we're talking a few weeks, but the other the other aspects, that systemic physiology can take a long, long time. And also it can get to a point where we can't treat. So we have to act sooner, but I don't want to be, I don't want to over medicalize it and be very negative because there, there, there is chance of recovery. And I have seen people get better past that window period. But what we do know is the sooner we get access to treatment, the better the outcome. That makes sense, obviously. And you, the difference between Emmett disordered eating and eating disorders, could you give your sports psychiatry take on that? So there's a really good study that's just come out in BJSM this month by, she's an Aussie as well, um, Kimberly Wells. And she did that with the Australian Institute of Sport. And the um, paper was about disordered eating in, in elite athletes. And, and what I love about this paper is it really gives you that spectrum of, well, what's um, optimised nutrition? So again, if you're an athlete, you're going to have optimised nutrition. How does that turn into disordered eating? 
And how does that go all the way to a full-blown eating disorder? So to kind of distinguish between the two, optimized nutrition, having you know a high focus on you know what we're consuming and our energy levels, if we compare that to the general population, we'd say, well, that is abnormal because it's not functional. But we know that in athletes who do that in season or during competition and can then stop that. So when they're not in training, when there's no goal orientation for that, we know that they don't have disordered eating. We know that that can become disordered when athletes are still reverting to these behaviours, even there's no function behind it. So we're talking about, you know, using laxatives or vomiting, restricting their intake. And when it's disordered, it's not so severe that it's having a significant disruption on their daily function, but it's still a behavior that's problematic. If we turn it into a full-blown eating disorder, so if we go all the way from um, slight disorder to anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa, we're then talking about, again, this significant weight loss in anorexia. We're talking about the biological implications, severe restriction of food, the body dysmorphia. It's difficult sometimes. It's really challenging sometimes to distinguish between well, what is slightly disordered and and what is you know a, a real problem here and i think that's why again having an expert who understands this area is it's, it's important to do that another limitation is that we can use a screening tool so i could give you a list of screening tools to say are you experiencing this yes are you experiencing this no in athletes we can use these screening tools but there's going to be a high risk of falsification because this is their careers this is their function and if there's any fear of punitive actions or this being fed back to the head coach, there's a risk of this being falsified. And we know from the studies, so a great study that was done in 2004, so that was uh, Sungot Borgen and Tortsvite, um, they did a great study. And what they did was they also showed that you need to do face-to-face -face assessments as a gold standard for recognising eating disorders in sport because it can be so easily missed if we just revert into to screening tools. On that note as well, um, what I really like about those kind of studies is it was the first real study that was really starting to pinpoint which the higher risk sports are when it comes to eating disorders. So if we're thinking about endurance sports, aesthetic sports, um, anti-gravity sports, and also weight category sports, we know that these are real high risky ones and we need to have that kind of extra level of caution when we're working with athletes in, in these sports. Are there drivers, common drivers, Emmett, that you might see? Like, is is trauma in someone's youth, or is are there, are there common patterns that you might see drivers of what would later become a, an eating disorder? Um, so, a good example is career transitions. So, we know that key points um, in an athlete's career can be very triggering. Um, again, the best examples would be injury, deselection, forced retirement both having performance issues, because the, um, the the irony of the situation is often athletes will, say if they get deselected or they're having performance issues, they may restrict initially and they may get faster initially because they, they've lost a bit of weight and they've shaved you know, a bit of time off, off the PB or, or, the, or they're back on track. So that kind of feeds into that mindset of, well, actually, I've lost weight. I'm back in the team now. I've proved everyone wrong. I know what I'm doing. But that then spirals out of control. And because athletes are so invested in this identity of being high-level exercisers, that it can become a coping mechanism. And that's what we often see. And we talk a lot about athletic identity. And when we talk about resilience, we talk a lot about, well, if we were to take away exercise out of your routine, say your identity was no longer exercise, what else have you got in that? So what else can you do that gives you another aspect of your identity? And if we're having decompensations or psychological stress, so like the transitions that I mentioned, or even if it's a normal stress that you or I may have, so it might be financial or it might be relationships, we can revert to these behaviours because it's just maladaptive. We found it's, um, it helps with our emotions and that this is when it can become a problem as well. You're listening to Dr. Emmett Mystery on this, an expert edition of the Physical Performance Show on all things athlete mental health. Support for today's show comes from the upcoming Masters Athlete Symposium. At the time of this episode release, we are just two days away from the world's first online Masters Athlete Symposium, a collaboration between the Physical Performance Show and prior featured expert of the show, Benoit Matthew, UK-based specialist scope physiotherapist. 
And the why behind the online symposium is to bring together a panel of world-leading experts to share around the topic of mastering master's athletes. If you're a master's athlete greater than 35 years of age, a coach, or someone that works in the sports or exercise sciences, then do not miss this event. Registration is 100% free. You'll gain access to all of the 16 speakers on the day. To register, jump over to masterathletes.online, masterathletes.online. And beyond the one-day symposium, the option exists to purchase a full suite of all the materials plus many bonuses for ongoing professional development. So don't miss it. The world's first online Masters Athletes Symposium. Register over at masterathletes.online. Support for today's show also comes from Pogo Physio's online telehealth consultations. If you are an endurance athlete frustrated by bone, tendon or joint related concerns, then Pogo Physio's online consultations are a remarkably effective means of crossing your physio finish line and getting back to your physical best. To find out more about Pogo Physio's online consultations, jump over to pogophysio.com.au forward slash telehealth. For now, let's jump back with Dr. Emmett Mystery on this all-important exploration around all things an athlete's mental health. Emmett, before we look at exercise as medicine uh, in a moment, just a few of these commonly sort of touted slash recognised uh, I guess labels I would, is what I would use for them, but ADHD. Uh, I know there's I haven't read the, the case studies book. I haven't got a, my hands on it yet, but I, I'll be looking for that. But I think there's a case study in there about an athlete perhaps with ADHD. I mean, what is it? We hear it all the time. And how it, can that influence an athlete's um, selection in sport, as in even self-selecting into sport in the first place, and then their continuance through life? Yeah, it's um, so ADHD in sport is probably one of the most contentious areas of elite sport because it has lots of implications in terms of um, medications that we prescribe in that. And when we were writing the book, it was probably the chapter that we had to rewrite the most because there's so many contentious views in the literature and sometimes it, it's a minefield. It, it's so confusing. But in terms of ADHD as a neurodevelopmental disorder, we're talking about from a very young age, it has to be from childhood because that is the nature of these types of developmental conditions. And we're talking, you know, that real struggle with concentration, inattention, you know, those kids are, you know, really fidgety, really struggle to focus on tasks. And it is really disruptive and it is really distressing for them. And it's not just in one aspect of their lives. So it's not just in school. We're also talking about family life and different, and different aspects of their lives. Now, the, the thing about ADHD is, I know we're going to come on to exercise as medicine, but sport can be therapeutic for ADHD because it gives you an outlet. It gives you a channel to managing that high levels of energy. So a lot of the chapter that we wrote was talking about the positive aspects of cycling as well. So that, sorry, the, the sport we did was ADHD and cycling. We spoke a lot about how it can be useful, but equally, when we then move on to elite sport, ADHD um, can be quite contentious as well because one of the first line prescriptions we have outside of the psychosocial aspects is methylphenidate. Now, methylphenidate can be um, performance enhancing. So it's technically a performance enhancing drug. For somebody to have that, they need to have a therapeutic use exemption. There's two ways of looking at it. One aspect is, well, if somebody has a genuine ADHD, a diagnosable ADHD, which prevents them from uh, being at optimum health, then we have a duty as uh, clinicians, again, focusing purely on health, to help them. The, the other flip side is saying, well, if there is a questionable diagnosis and we're now giving somebody a performance enhancing drug, they're going to have an unfair advantage because they're going to be, you know, in terms of their, their physiology, we're going to get that enhanced response. So I'd love to give you a simple answer to it. Even in my own mind, I'm still debating with the evidence and it's still kind of, it's still work in progress, but we do have the tools to organize. I mean, we do, we do have the tools to assess it, but I think if I'm, if I'm in that situation, I'm definitely looking at the MDT thinking about how do we do a thorough assessment. So psychologists have their own independent assessments that they can do, and the psychiatrist can also do a, a psychiatric assessment as well. But the key about conditions like ADHD is we've got to work with the athlete and we've got to work with the family as well, because a lot of it comes from the history. A lot of it comes from the parents describing the child's upbringing and how they were and what their behaviours were like. And it must be, uh, I'm assuming here, a genetic streak of this as well. Is that fair or is yeah, it more of a learned behaviour? Yeah, a, a genetic component. 
Um, in terms of the, the percentages, I wouldn't be able to answer that. Um, mm. I don't know the exact figures, but I know in the literature they have spoken about genetic vulnerability, how it can run in families as well. And, and just to clarify as well, Emmett, you've used the term M, the acronym MDT a few times, medical... Yeah, so, so that's that's a multidisciplinary well, team. Multidisciplinary team, Yeah, Sorry, so we're yes. just talking about... Um, like for a, a good example of MDT for me, the best example I can ever use is eating disorders. Mm. To work in eating disorders, you just cannot have one clinician. You've got to have a dietitian, you've got to have a physiotherapist, you need a psychiatrist, a psychologist, you need a nurse, because we're all, we're all adding our own expertise into that area. Yeah, no, great. And Emma, the, is it a fair observation that I tend to observe in, in the, the world that I inhabit, which is sports injuries, I'm not a, a clinician to be able to diagnose these things, but high levels of energy and and, and those some of those traits uh fidget fidgetiness uh inattention is it a fair observation that people that go into some of these rigorous intensive sporting pursuits recreationally and professionally such as say endurance sports say triathlon uh or distance running that there might be a, a strong streak of adhd type behavior Amongst some of those, yeah, athletes? And I think, yeah, I think it's um, it's distinction between traits. So we all have traits, and then distinction that between well, what's a trait, and then what becomes a disorder. And again, it's it's knowing well, how do we say is something functional or is it abnormal and it's risk to themselves or to others, and is it something that we need to address? Because sport, in principle, is beautiful. It's such a great way of using in a, as an outlet for energy. There's a sports physician whose name I forgot. But when he was talking about endurance athletes, he spoke about this kind of OCD type personality, very driven behaviors can get very focused and obsessive about their goals. And that's why we're pursuing these extremes. If we keep that, in, you know, if we can manage that and we can uh, mitigate the risks of overuse injuries and exercise addiction and, you know, this over emphasis on the athletic identity, then that can be functional and we don't need to pathologize that and, and manage that. But if we tip the balance and it becomes dangerous to themselves or to others, that's where we need to step in. And that's where this duty of care steps in again. So functional versus maladaptive and that difference between traits and it becoming a, a disorder. So it's not necessarily a, a liability that you may have some of those traits, but it, it could become a, a maladaptive uh coping strategy i guess if 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 if, if you like and it's one more sort of label that many people if not most people would be familiar with and, and and how you see that play out in sports would be asd so autism spectrum disorder do you and just on the adhd Emmett, i often joke that if you wanted to find all the the type a personalities you could probably go to a triathlon transition area and, and then you've pulled everyone out of society <laughs> down at your local uh rigorous sporting pursuit but the asd uh, autism spectrum disorder do you see that you see tr traits and you might be able to define this for people to, to become a bit more familiar with it in some of the elite performers in all honesty i don't have much experience working in autism and also autism in sport it's not my area of expertise but what I can say is, you know, the autism traits that we talk about, you know, in terms of the, the kind of colloquial views and, you know, the generalised population views, what I do know is that rigidity and that um, that mindset and, and how, you know, how we define autism. What I do know is that in eating disorders, so this kind of obsession with, you know, very fixed on rules, you know, very preoccupied on their own views and, and you know, how they relate to the world, I see a lot of that in eating disorders and in the last few years we've seen that often in eating disorders it can present as a comorbidity so again thinking about differential diagnosis if somebody comes in front of you with an eating disorder it's also worth exploring autism in answer to your question about how it presents in sport i don't think i'm the best person mm. to answer that because i just i don't think i can give you a, an accurate answer of that having some familiarity with some of the traits i i often just wonder if you know and, and it could make sense that they've achieved remarkable things in many cases or in some cases because they do view the world a bit differently. Um, and so uh, that's, that's the, the, the uh, underlining for my, uh, for my question there, Emmett. Yeah, yeah. But I think, it's, I think it's, it's a very valid point because that is the athlete mindset. Isn't it? You know, we talk about, you know, that discipline, that focus for the goal. And, you know, the, I think, again, if we see traits and the functionality behind them that can be viewed as a positive. 
If you missed last week's Expert Edition, it featured Canadian-based researcher and physiotherapist J.F. Esculier, who is also one of the registered faculty speaking at this weekend's coming Masters Athletes Online Symposium. And the topic of conversation on last week's Expert Edition was the often asked question, is running bad for our knees? Here's a little snippet of my conversation with J.F. Esculier. Typically, if you tell me, you know, I'm running 30 kilometers a week, which would be three times 10 kilometers or three times one hour during my week, I'll get you to run five or six times during your week instead. And that may be the same overall 30 kilometers, but splitting that up and spreading, distributing the load into more sessions will help the joint to uh, react better. If you missed the full conversation, jump back and enjoy the episode. Whilst there, peruse the archives, that in right back to episode one, featuring Ironman surf life-saving champion, Ali Day. For now, let's jump back with Dr. Emmett Mystery on this expert edition around all things athlete mental health. Emmett, exercise as medicine, as you started this, this conversation outlining that one of your roles is advocating for enhanced levels of exercise uh, for mental health. So how can exercise be medicine, if you like, or, or how, what's the mechanism by which it can be a, a positive force for psycholo- mental, with mental health? Going down the lines of biopsychosocial and in terms of holistic principles, um, exercise is probably one of the most robust antidepressants that we've got. The evidence base is so strong, and I made reference to some names before. Another name to add to that would be a Brazilian research called Philippe Schutt. So in 2015, he did an updated meta-analysis. So he got all the studies, just grouped them together, and said, look, what is the effect of exercise? Not just for mild distress, but we're talking about a diagnosable major depressive disorder. So the limitations in the literature beforehand was always like, well, yeah, exercise is great. It may have some antidepressant effects. When we look at the high quality evidence, it's not there. But he demonstrated that it is there. And even if you factor in publication bias, it's still there and it's robust. In answer to your question about biopsychosocial, when we talk about brain structures, so we talk about neurogenesis, so there's connections in our brain. We talk about the hippocampus, so we talk about memory. Um, we can talk about endorphins, so we can talk about that uh, runner's high. We can talk about BDNF, so brain-derived neurotrophic factor. All these different chemicals, which we don't st- we don't fully understand it, but we know that these are all regulated when we exercise. The psychosocial elements i think are even more robust and i think this is a real strong reason as to why we need to advocate it because the psychological aspect says is a congruent way it's a nice way of managing anxiety it's a nice way it's a nice way of managing distress it's a good use for self distress uh, self uh, self esteem it's a nice distraction technique and socially so we know for older adults as well being in group formats and exercising is a great way of bonding and it can help with depression as well. So if we were to compare it to medication, and if we, if we could bottle it up, it would be. It would be, a, it would be a wonder drug. The only two situations in psychiatry when I express caution with exercise is one, eating disorders, like I mentioned, because that can turn into something else. Again, a real small percentage, the overwhelming majority of population will benefit from exercise. Um, It's only a very small minority that I'm referring to here. And the second example would be bipolar affective disorder and mania. And what we know is that patients who report mania, when they're doing extreme forms of exercise or high frequency exercise, they can have more manic symptoms as well. Now, the difficulty here is that correlation, so these symptoms that they're describing, is not causation. It doesn't necessarily mean that the exercise is causing mania, but it's very difficult to distinguish. And again, I can't give you a definitive answer on it, but what I can say, those are the two situations where I just have a bit more caution uh, when it comes to advocating exercise for mental health. The final example would be um, in older adult services. So at the moment, I work in a memory clinic. And when I have somebody in front of me in clinic, if somebody does not have dementia and they tell me, look, Dr. Mystery, it's been nice to meet you. How do I prevent dementia? What are the most important things? So aging, (laughs) we're all going to age. That risk factor is always going to be there. In terms of modifiable risk factors... Exercise is, is there. Exercise is very much up there, along with you know smoking, alcohol, um, cessation, stress management, optimizing our hearing. 
And I think we as clinicians, we do have that duty of care to be advocating exercise. The only limitation is that we can't be too idealistic about it because often in psychiatry and severe mental illness, a lot of the illness is poor motivation, uh, lack of energy. Some of the medications that can be prescribed in psychiatry can cause weight gain, can cause diabetes. These are certain ones, so not, not all of them. So I think I feel our duty is to make sure we, we're having this transparent discussion about why it's so powerful, but we have to do that in a motivational way and also be able to take a step back and say, look, we understand that you are struggling with your mental health at the moment, but there may be certain opportunities where we can work on that. And when I was, this is going back a few years, I used to work with the Arsenal Football Club's community football team and they had one for mental illness. And all the patients who I referred there they always followed up. They always came to clinic because we had something positive to talk about. We were talking about how exercise was helping them and, you know, that bonding in sport. So I think there is so much we can do through sport and exercise, but there are some limitations as well, like like I've just mentioned. Yeah, and those limitations I think are, are great and, and so worth mentioning. But as you said, Emmett, the, the wonder drug, and you use the word neurogenesis, you, you mentioned effects with memory. I think everyone would appreciate endorphins neurogenesis what is that Emmett can you share a little bit about neurogenesis so that's just about you know so in, in our brain we have neurons so we have these structures and genesis is, is creation so we know that from exercise there can be neurogenesis they have spoke a lot about the hippocampus so that sits so we call it the medial temporal lobes so those kind of internal structures within our brain and that's where the hippocampi sit and that is for memory and now there has been some evidence suggesting that when we exercise there is greater neurogenesis there is more production of these connections um, within our brain can we take it as far as saying we can become more intelligent if we exercise <laughs> well there is i mean there's there is some evidence of the, the research that's been done even in severe conditions like schizophrenia we know that con uh, cognition has improved after doing aerobic um, activity, moderate level. So I think there is something there and it's so powerful and we have to harness it. Dr. Emmett Mystery, uh, your recent publication, The Case Studies book, who would benefit from that? This, the listenership of the physical performance shows, athletes of all levels, coaches, health and fitness professionals, who would benefit from that and, and where, can, uh, where can that book be found? So the book is um, primarily for clinicians. So if you work in sport, whether you're a physiotherapist, the sports medic, the coach, from my personal point of view, obviously a biased opinion, uh, it's the perfect book if you want to explore not just mental distress and mental well-being, but we're talking about severe mental illness. So when you get to that point where you've tried all the least restrictive things and now you're worried about the athlete. Our best USP is that we've managed to involve athletes. So we've managed for every single chapter, we've got a professional, relatively high profile athlete to give us their perspective. So every single chapter we wrote, we then sent it to an athlete and we said, look, tell us what you think. Have we, have we got it right? Is this realistic? Or have we missed something important? A good example of that, so coming back to the cycling and the ADHD chapter that you mentioned, we involved Luke Rowe from Team Ineos and his views on cycling. And one thing that we didn't factor in on that chapter is the Adams criteria and the regime of testing. So when you're an athlete in season and you have to have your urine test for uh, anti-doping, I didn't know that you have to be within 60 minutes of a testing facility if you want to, if you want to um, get that tested. And we didn't even factor that in. So to include that, we felt we'd really benefited because we realised actually not only are we coming from our clinical perspective, but we've tried to blend in that athlete uh, perspective as well. So from that point of view, I think it's helpful because we've blended the latest evidence base for severe mental illness. That's all based on the International Olympic Consensus Statement and all the publications that came in the BJSM last year. And all the curriculums, so the five MCQs at the end of the chapters, are based on the International Society of Sports Psychiatrists curriculum. So every pattern of mental illness we see in sport is basically factored into the book. So really... Uh, any clinician working in sport or health professional, uh, it would be a, a useful addition to your, to your library. I'll certainly be uh, picking up my copy, uh, Emmett. Emmett, every guest of the Physical Performance Show uh, issues a physical challenge to the listeners for the week. So what is Dr. Emmett Mystery's physical challenge going to be uh, for the week? It's probably a bit controversial because it's probably against the 
kind of ethos of endurance and peak and hitting extremes. But on the kind of topic of resilience that I spoke about, um, one exercise that we do is um, get a pen and paper and really think about your identity. Think about um, what is it that defines me. So draw, if you just draw a circle, think of it as a cake and split it up and say, what is it about me? What is my, my identity? If you find that a huge chunk of that is exercise, there is a potential problem there. And you need to think about, well, what else can I replace? So say if I can't exercise or I get injured, what else can I do? So my challenge is to do that exercise. And if you think that exercise is taking a huge chunk of that, next week, drop a session of your exercise and do something else. Might be meditation, might be spending time with family, might be picking up a new hobby. Just do something a little bit different so that you've got a bit more of a, a resilience toolkit so you've got something else that you can focus on. We might call this the Dr. Emmett Mysteries Cake Identity Challenge. Uh, I just did my cake as you said that, Emmett, and uh, I might need to uh, hang on this conversation with you and get a consult, I think. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that challenge on. Yeah, excellent. Well, I think that's it. I think this is it. Those who work in sport, we are at risk of this as well because we are around those environments and uh, that's in the literature as well. So I think having that insight on ourselves can be quite powerful. And, and just on the on the cake uh, there, Dr. Mystery, if it's, you say if it's a fair chunk, uh, a fair chunk's going to be different for everyone, I guess. Subjective, uh, yeah. what, what are we looking for, a quarter of that cake or a half of the cake? I mean, I know it's, it's subjective, it's, <laughs> but, but what would you suggest? Yeah, I think, again, I'm going to come back to it again, all about function. Mm. So... Are you exercising so much that it's having a function on your daily life? And I'd love to give you know a, a start or a percentage of that, and I don't think it'd be fair for me to do that. Yeah. I think thinking about what else you could do, and it's going to be subjective. Yeah. Um, it's, it's entirely up to the person doing it. Yeah, and no, I look uh, appreciate that. Uh, and finally, Doctor Mystery, every uh, guest of the show also boils down their learnings to date. We say this show is about the highs, lows, and learnings. Uh, this being an expert edition, of course, uh, what would your single piece of advice be to the listeners of the show out there looking to pursue and be their own physical best uh, in terms of them doing so? One piece of advice, what would it be? My piece of advice would be respect spectrums because we all, we all sit on them and sometimes they can be insidious. So if we're going to boil it down, I'd say exercise and nutrition. So be careful of our identities and how we relate ourselves to exercise and nutrition and try and keep it in moderation. And if you feel that you are becoming too invested in the exercise identity, work on something else, spread it out so that you've got different interests as well. Mm, so it's kind of enmeshed with the physical challenge for the week, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Respect spectrums. Dr. Emmett Mystery, you're active over on Instagram and Twitter. Where can uh, people follow follow your output? Yeah, so I'm on Instagram, Twitter. So it's at Dr. So DR and then A Mystery Psych. So all one word, Dr. A Mystery Psych. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn as well. So that's just my name. I'm more than happy to be contacted. Um, just, just drop me a line. Absolute fantastic contribution to the show, Dr. Mystery. And I do recommend everyone follow along. Uh, this is an area that we all need uh, upskilling around, clinician or, or, or athlete or coach or anyone interested in this field. Uh, thank you for your contribution. And uh, we're only days away from the Masters Athlete Symposium, of which you're featuring as one of the experts. So uh, the 40-plus athlete, anything you would finish off there in terms of, apart from obviously tuning into your presentation that we should know? Uh, well, again, Masters Athlete, similar to ath the athlete literature, it's still a novel area in terms of evidence base. And on the talk that I give, if I like remember rightly, I did say that the evidence base is even less developed. Um, in master's athletes. Uh, it's just not prioritised. But what I do know is that in master's athletes, that relationship with exercise does change. From what I've heard in terms of, it's, it's less about quantity, but it's more about the quality of the exercise, just enjoying the exercise, knowing that I'm still able to exercise. So there is that different relationship there. So if you are interested in that, I will be commenting on that on that on that symposium. Yeah, Masters Athlete Online Symposium. Dr. Mystery, thank you once again. Fantastic. Thank you for having me. So there you have it, another expert edition of the Physical Performance Show. And I trust you took some learnings from Dr. Emmett Mysteries' sharings today. If you did, please reach out 
and let Dr. Mystery know. You'll find Dr. Mystery easily available over on Instagram at Dr. A-M-I-S-T-R-Y-P-S-Y-C-H. And you'll find Dr. Mystery over on Twitter at Dr. A Mystery Psych. If you work in the field of sport or exercise sciences, do pick up your copy of Case Studies in Sports Psychiatry. It's the first book of its kind and it is a must-have for your library. Now keep the podsies coming and that's a screenshot of the episode you're enjoying and simply tagging in the show at Physical Performance Show on Instagram. You'll find me at Brad underscore beer. Massive thanks to those leaving ratings and reviews over on iTunes. They really are rocket fuel to read. And of course, all feedback for the show is always welcome. Feel free to send me a DM anytime on social media. Massive thanks to the great folk who make the show possible each and every week. Daryl Misson, our audio engineer, Susan Wilkin on all things show administration, Matthew Alden, all things show graphic design, and Lily Burden, all things social media and behind the scenes. Now, once again, if you are yet to register for the free upcoming Athletes Online Symposium brought to you by the Physical Performance Show in conjunction with Function to Fitness and Benoit Matthew, then don't miss the great learnings from this event. Registration is free, masterathletes.online. And the materials will be available post the One Day Online Symposium for your professional development library. Now, coming up on next week's episode of the Physical Performance Show, we throw over to a featured performer episode, and I'll share with you a conversation that I recently had with Australian female 800-metre record holder, Katrina Bissett. Here's a snippet of my conversation with Katrina. I'm pretty mean to myself, but in in a fun way. Like, I always think about, you know, what time that I want to run or what, you know, what I want to achieve. So when when I'm really, really hurting in, like, the end of a, you know, a 1K rep or something where it's just killing me, I always say to myself, it's like, do you want that gold medal or not? To enjoy the full episode, Katrina's highs, lows and many learnings, be sure to be tuning in. Until then, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer and this has been The Physical Performance Show.